According to the many saints of Newark, old Silvio's pops was none other than Cologero Dante, a DeMeo soldier who met his untimely end sometime in 59. Now, Silvio's got that classic male pattern baldness thing going on. And let's be honest, he's been fighting that battle since he was rocking diapers. His hair? Well, surprise, surprise, it's a toupee. Before that, he was a proud owner of the world's most legendary comb-over. You see, Silvio's initial career path was to be the next Frank Sinatra. But I guess the world just wasn't ready for the greatness. Still, he kept one foot in showbiz through the years by owning more clubs in North Jersey than you can count, and being the go-to guy for aspiring starlets looking to make it big. Yeah, you could say Silvio had his finger in many showbiz pies. During his time rolling with Johnny Soprano's crew, Silvio made buddies with the one and only Salvatore Big Pussy Bon Pensiero and Polly Walnuts Gualtieri. He even played the role of Tony Soprano's early mentor. You could say he was like the wise, bald Yoda of the Soprano family. Now let's rewind to 67, where Silvio was already a big shot mobster and a key player in the Soprano crew of the Daimeo crime family. That makes him a certified OG, at least a decade older than our main man, Tony Soprano. He even showed up at Janice Soprano's confirmation party, rubbing elbows with the likes of Pussy and Hollywood Dick Moltisanti. Oh, and don't forget, he was the guy you could find counting stacks of cash at Satriale's pork store. When he wasn't making money rain at the butcher shop, Silvio was the proud owner of Club Silhouette, where he and the crew would kick back, sip on some drinks, and probably debate the merits of the Sinatra versus Dean Martin feud. By 72, he'd solidified his spot in the Multisanti crew, serving under Dickie Multisanti in a role that was basically the conciliar and training gig for the big show he'd later put on with Tony. Ah, you see, when Harold McBrayer thought he could just waltz into Dickie's numbers racket, he had another thing coming. Silvio, Polly, and Pussy decided it was time to pay a little visit to McBrayer's cousin Cyril's car shop. And let me tell you, that visit was about as friendly as a porcupine's hug. Polly, always the charmer, decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Cyril, using an impact drill as his conversation starter. But Cyril, in a surprising burst of adrenaline, broke free and went for Silvio like he was the last cannoli on the table. Silvio, not one to back down, gave him three good reasons to reconsider. And by reasons, I mean bullets. Now, when Dickie and Tony had their little falling out, guess who stepped in to play the wise old sage on Christmas? He's there, spouting praise for Tony like he's the second coming of Sinatra, saying Tony's gonna go places in this thing of ours. Of course, that pep talk lasted about as long as a snowflake in July because wouldn't you know it. Dickie met his maker just minutes later in a hit ordered by none other than Junior Soprano. Talk about your classic family gatherings. Ralphie Cifaretto spilled the beans about Silvio's role in the early criminal careers of Tony, Ralph, and Jackie April. Apparently, Silvio was right there in the mix when they pulled off that daring robbery of Feech Lamana's card game. You know, the one that had everyone sweating bullets? Silvio was the mentor-in-chief, helping Tony slide into his father Johnny's crew like a well-oiled cannoli into a hungry mobster's mouth. But let's not forget Silvio's other talents. The man's Al Pacino impressions? Legendary. They were like a one-man show at every sit-down. And don't even get me started on his fashion sense. He dresses so sharp, he could cut a cigar with his cufflinks. Plus, the guy's got a brain for movies that's thicker than Vin Diesel's neck. So next time you need someone to shoot straight and make you laugh, Silvio's your guy. It was none other than our pal Silvio who dropped the bombshell on Tony about Uncle Junior's grand plan to whack Pussy Malanga right there in Artie Bucco's restaurant in 98. And let's not forget it was Silvio who got the honor of starting that little Vesuvio's bonfire, all in the name of saving the restaurant's reputation. Because really, who wants their veal parm tainted by the smell of burnt wood, am I right? Then came the short and not-so-sweet war of 99 with the Junior Soprano crew. Silvio was right there with Tony, and let's give the man his due. He stayed supportive when Tony spilled the beans about his therapy sessions. Not every mobster can say they've got a shrink on the speed dial. Now, Silvio, he's like the Swiss army knife of Tony's crew. While most of the guys turn into fire-breathing dragons at the drop of a cannoli, Silvio's the voice of reason. He's the guy who makes everyone sing Kumbaya before they bust out the baseball bats. He's Tony's go-to guy for sit-downs where they talk it out over espresso instead of bullets. No wonder Tony relies on Silvio like he's the last cannoli in the box. When Silvio stepped up as conciliere after Tony became acting boss, it was like the perfect fit. He's the brains behind the operation, the guy who keeps the mob hits and poker games on schedule. But let's not forget, even Mr. Coolheaded has his limits. 
One little remark from Fat Dom about Vito and Carlo and Silvio turned into a hurricane of fists and fury. That ended up being Dom's last poker night, if you catch my drift. Silvio's got his fingers in all sorts of pies, loan sharking, bookmaking, and let's not forget his management roles at the Bada Bing. That place isn't just a strip joint. It's the mob's unofficial headquarters. And hey, sometimes it moonlights as a brothel, but we won't tell the health department about that. Now, here's the kicker. For a guy who spends half his life in strip clubs, Silvio's actually a doting dad. He calls his daughter Heather the Principessa. And when her soccer coach got a little too cozy with one of the players, Silvio was ready to serve up a dose of mob justice. But surprise, surprise, he played it by Tony's rule book and let the authorities handle it. And believe it or not, the guy's got a soft spot for his wife, Gabriella, despite his occasional wanderings. Love and loyalty, it's a complicated dance in this thing of ours. Silvio, the guy with a penchant for cleaning up the family messes, literally. It's like he's the designated traitor whisperer. You got Jimmy Altieri, who thought he could rat out the crew? Silvio sent him on a one-way ticket to sleep with the fishes back in 99. Then, there's the infamous Big Pussy, who sang like a canary to the feds. Silvio, Tony, and Polly sent him on a swim he wouldn't be coming back from in 2000. Adriana, poor Adriana, caught in the FBI's snare. Silvio had to make sure she didn't spill any more beans, so he sent her on a one-way ride to the great strip club in the sky in 2004. And let's not forget Bert Hervasi, who decided to cozy up to the Lupertazzi family. Silvio showed him the ropes, literally, with a garret in 2007. In 2002, Silvio's judgment had a little hiccup. Tony was playing family favorites with Christopher Moltisanti, making him the go-between guy. Silvio, not too thrilled with that idea, decided to stir the pot by encouraging Patsy Parisi to help himself to some construction site goodies, despite Tony and Chris's orders. And then there was that whole Columbus Day showdown with Native American protesters. Tony saw it as a distraction, but Silvio was like a dog with a bone, refusing to let it go. Even when Tony had exhausted every avenue of winning that dispute, Silvio just couldn't take his foot off the gas. Tony noticed, but nothing came of it. Probably because he knew Silvio's loyalty was as solid as a cement shoe. So remember, when you need someone to handle family matters, Silvio's your guy! Just make sure you don't end up on his cleanup duty list. Ah, Silvio and Polly, now there's a duo for the ages. These two go way back, like spaghetti and meatballs. Silvio's always been aware of Polly's tendency to hold onto his cash, like it's glued to his hands, and his knack for finding trouble faster than a bloodhound on a scent. You know, Silvio's even told Tony that they both know Polly's not exactly the king of tribute kicking. But that's just Polly, a penny pinching, danger dodging maestro. When Polly started straying toward the Lupertasi crime family, Silvio tried to give him a little nudge in the right direction. They had their fair share of spats, especially when Polly ended up in the Pine Barrens mess while doing Silvio's rounds. But like any good mob story, the dust eventually settled, and Polly crawled back into Tony's good graces. Silvio's been Tony's rock through thick and thin, helping him navigate the treacherous waters of mob life. He's like the guy who reminds Tony not to shoot first and ask questions later. Because let's face it, Tony's got a hair trigger temper that makes a volcano look like a spa day. Then there was that time when Tony took a little vacation in the coma land, and Silvio had to step up as acting boss. At first, Silvio thought it was all gravy, even regretting not taking Jackie Aprile Sr.'s offer to become boss back in the 90s. But then reality slapped him like a brick to the face. The pressure, the hounding, the pestering, it was enough to make him wheeze like an asthmatic penguin. So, Silvio gladly handed the boss hat back to Tony like, you can have this hot potato. Back in his comfortable conciliaire role, Silvio kept doing what he does best, counseling Tony through all the drama. When Vito came out of the closet, so to speak, Silvio convinced Tony that giving him a pass would be like throwing a match into a gas tank. And when Tony was being a bit of a jerk after Bobby Bacala's injury, Silvio just had to give him the look to set him straight. Silvio always had a knack for finding himself in the middle of some hair-raising situations, didn't he? Like the time Vito Spatafor rolled back into town, fresh from his New Hampshire adventure. Silvio, always the voice of reason, mentioned that the popular sentiment was to kick Vito to the curb. But Tony, being Tony, decided to let Vito run a prostitution ring in Atlantic City. I guess you could say Tony had a thing for letting bygones be bygones as long as there was some money to be made. But then came Phil Leotardo, the wet blanket of the mob world, all hot and bothered about Vito being back in New Jersey. 
Silvio and Tony realized they couldn't keep bickering with Phil over this. It was like trying to win an argument with a brick wall. Not going to happen. So they decided that if they wanted to keep their precious no-show jobs, Vito had to take a one-way trip to the afterlife. Silvio had been pushing for this all along and told Tony it was the right move and, hey, not to lose any sleep over it. And just like that, Carlo Gervasi was handed the unenviable task of taking care of Vito. Now, when Phil and his goons finally did the deed and offered Vito, without asking anyone for permission, mind you, Tony told Silvio it wasn't about Vito, it was about him. Silvio suggested they go after one of Phil's guys, but Tony was trying to keep things low-key. So instead of a war, they decided to blow up Phil's wire room in Sheep's Head Bay. Because nothing says, I mean business, like a good old-fashioned explosion. But the real fireworks happened at Satriali's pork store, where Fat Dom thought it was a brilliant idea to make jokes about Vito's love life and hint that Carlo might be hiding some secrets of his own. Silvio, usually the picture of calm, lost it and went full-on vacuum cleaner attack mode. He smashed his handheld vacuum over Dom's noggin and held him tight while Carlo did the dirty deed. Tony swung by the shop later, but Silvio tried to keep him away. Of course, Tony being Tony, he had to see what all the fuss was about. Then there was the lunch date with Jerry Torciano, where an assassin decided to make a surprise appearance and ruin everyone's appetite. Tony, always the concerned boss, worried that Silvio might have gotten caught in the crossfire. It's like they say, mob lunches are always so unpredictable. But Silvio's bad luck didn't end there. Bert Gervasi, the rebellious one, tried to rope Silvio into a coup against Tony. Silvio's response? Well, he showed Bert the ropes, literally, by strangling him at home. No coup for you! And then came the assassination plots, one after another. First, Bobby took a bullet. Then, Silvio and Patsy Parisi had a close encounter with a pair of trigger-happy foes outside the Bada Bing. Bullets were flying, and Silvio was playing hide-and-seek with his pistol in the back seat like it was a game of finder's keepers. He managed to grab it in the nick of time, but not without taking a bullet or two himself. Patsy did his best to hold them off, but they had it out for Silvio. He got shot in the chest, and Patsy ran for the hills. So, off to the hospital Silvio went, and it wasn't for a tonsillectomy. Pauli Gualtieri, the bearer of bad news, informed Tony that Silvio survived the hit but was in a coma. The doctors didn't seem too optimistic about him waking up and, well, let's just say it's not the kind of sleep you set an alarm for. Tony paid him a visit, held his hand for a bit, and gave him the silent treatment. The doctors might have had their doubts, but one thing's for sure. Silvio's adventures in the mob were far from a snooze fest. Rest in peace, buddy, or at least in peaceful mobster slumber. Let's delve into the remarkable journey of how Federico Castelluccio landed the role of Furio, the Italian enforcer who despises everything north of his homeland. Back in the day, David Chase was searching for an actor who could not only speak Italian fluently, but also handle himself in the tough world of The Sopranos. On top of that, this character was set to become Carmela Soprano's romantic interest, making the casting even more crucial. However, the auditions did not start off on the right foot. As Terrence Winter revealed on the Talking Sopranos podcast, the initial audition process for Furio was quite a comedy show. We went through so many guys, he quipped with a grin. And everybody sounded like they stepped right out of an Abbott and Amp Costello skit. It was, quite frankly, a disaster. Then, like a guardian angel descending upon the casting room, in walked Federico. Winter couldn't help but recall his first impression of Castelluccio, saying, I said this to Federico? And I swear on my mother's cannoli, he is exactly what I envisioned when I conjured up that character. However, they weren't ready to pop the champagne corks just yet. They needed to be absolutely certain that Federico was the real deal, especially when it came to Furio's combat skills. Thus, the fateful moment arrived. The Sopranos team wanted to see if Federico had the chops to bring Furio to life in a convincing manner. Terrence Winter vividly remembers the tension in the air as Federico prepared to throw a punch. It was as if the fate of the Italian-American mafia rested on that one punch. As Castelluccio threw that punch, Terrence Winter, who had seen his fair share of questionable on-screen fisticuffs, couldn't believe his eyes. He mimed the violence, and I couldn't help but exclaim, Holy cannoli! This guy is the real deal! Winter confessed, a grin spreading across his face. Little did they know that this punch would cement Castelluccio's role as Furio, and the rest, as they say is history. Now let's talk about Furio's journey in the Sopranos series. 
Furio, with all the subtlety of a mobster trying to find his way through an Olive Garden menu, swiftly ascended the ranks as Tony Soprano's personal protector and enforcer. With a knack for ensuring Tony's safety while keeping the mob's chaos in check, Furio became a beloved character on the show, almost as cherished as a fresh cannoli. Federico Castelluccio's portrayal was so spot on that even the ducks in Tony's pool would quack their approval. Yet life in the mob isn't all cannoli and Sunday dinners. Furio grappled with the moral maze of his criminal career, torn between his allegiance to Tony and his own sense of right and wrong. It was a real-life soap opera, complete with more twists and turns than the plot of a Sopranos episode. Adding to the spicy drama, Furio had a rather complicated relationship with Carmela, Tony's wife. Their interactions were like a game of hide-and-seek in the meat freezer, intense and full of tension. Before his Jersey debut, Furio had quite the resume. He worked for a wealthy Olive Garden owner, not the kind with unlimited breadsticks, and dabbled in some side gigs for the mob queen pin, Annalisa Zucca. However, it was his willingness to take a bullet for Don Vittorio during a fireworks fiasco that really got Tony's attention. Tony, always the mastermind, concocted a plan to import Furio to Jersey. He turned to his buddy Artie Bucco, who agreed to help Furio obtain a work visa by letting him work at his restaurant. Of course, everyone knew Furio's real job was to protect Tony, not serve Linguini. Once in town, Furio became the apple of everyone's eye, especially Carmela's. He was more popular than a surprise shipment of fresh prosciutto, but their relationship was as complicated as a mob hit gone wrong. Furio had the hots for Carmela, and she was equally enamored. They'd find an excuse to be near each other, like a pair of lovers in a Shakespearean tragedy. When Carmela visited Furio's house to discuss home renovations, she brought along AJ as her personal chaperone, a real buzzkill for their simmering attraction. On one fateful trip to Italy for his father's funeral, Furio spilled the cannoli beans to his uncle about his feelings for Carmela. His uncle, seasoned in the ways of mob love, issued a stern warning about the dangers of romancing the Don's wife. The only way for Furio to be with Carmela? To take a shot at Tony himself. Talk about a real mobster love triangle. In a later episode of The Sopranos, Furio and Tony found themselves at a wild shindig, where Tony's drunken antics with other ladies left Furio questioning if this guy was even worthy of Carmela. The scene was so chaotic that even Polly Walnuts would have had trouble cracking a nut. And then, the plot thickened like Mama's marinara sauce. As the two mobsters were about to board a helicopter, Furio had a godfather moment and decided to give Tony a hands-on flying lesson right into the chopper's blades. But hold on to your cannoli, because Furio's loyalty to the family and his old-school mob code stopped him from turning Tony into helicopter parmigiana. Realizing he could no longer stand beside Tony, Furio made like a magician and disappeared, leaving for Naples like a silent whisper in the wind. He even pulled a Houdini by dropping a voicemail at the Bada Bing at 4.30 in the morning saying, Ciao, I'm out of here. Carmela, like a caged canary with a secret, later spilled the beans to Tony about her feelings for Furio. Tony, never one to let sleeping dogs lie, promised to give Furio the one-way ticket to the big casino in the sky if he ever crossed paths with him. But here's the real mystery. After Furio's vanishing act, he became as scarce as a white tiger in the Sopranos crew, leaving fans scratching their heads. Now, in a twist as unpredictable as a plot from the show, David Chase, the mastermind behind the Sopranos, intentionally left Furio's fate up in the air. He wanted fans to use their noodles and dream up their own endings, rather than spoon-feeding them with a definitive conclusion. And hey, isn't that what made The Sopranos so legendary? Speaking of cannolis, as James Gandolfini, who was our unforgettable Tony Soprano, soared to stardom, he was making demands bigger than Junior after becoming an acting boss. He wanted a fatter wallet, which had the show's producers sweating bullets. To balance the books, they decided to cut some of the supporting cast, and poor Furio got the short end of the cannoli. Money talks, and even in the mob, it says, Arrive Derchi. But let's shine a spotlight on a fan theory that's been circulating in the dark corners of Sopranos fandom. Some armchair gangsters out there have cooked up a story that Furio met a grisly end at the hands of his own family back in Naples. The reason? To keep Tony Soprano from going all Soprano on them over some supposed romance with Carmela. Now forget about it. The idea that Furio's own flesh and blood would off him for a fling is as believable as Vito Spadafore's aspirations of being a male model. 
And let's not forget that the folks in Naples probably saw Tony as a bigger clown than Richie April in a Napoleon hat. So the thought that they'd go to extremes to please him is about as likely as Polly Walnuts becoming a vegetarian. In fact, it's more probable that Tony's threat to whack Furio was just a way to give Carmela the old Sicilian stink eye, rather than a concrete plan to send Furio to that great pizzeria in the sky. The Sopranos always had more layers than a grandma's lasagna, and sometimes the mystery is better than the answer. To cap it all off, Furio was the embodiment of a genuine mobster, a shining star among the colorful characters Tony Soprano often found himself surrounded by. He possessed a razor-sharp intellect, movie star looks, an unwavering self-assuredness, a knack for getting the job done, a heart as cold as ice. Yet he had a knack for staying low-key when the situation demanded it. Furio's aversion to golf was only matched by his lightning-fast reflexes, always there to protect you when a pesky bee dared to land on your hat. After Junior crowned himself the head honcho of the DeMeo family, he started throwing his weight around like a bull in a china shop. First on his hit list was Hesh's loan sharking gig, and he slapped a cool 500,000 grand tax on it. Tony, always the smooth talker, decided to pull some strings and get Johnny Sack involved. So, they meet up at a fancy Manhattan restaurant where Johnny is celebrating his anniversary with his better half. Tony spills the beans, trying to make it look like Hesh went to Johnny for help, all while making sure Junior doesn't feel like a chopped liver. Johnny, ever the player, agrees to help. Later, they have a sit-down with Junior outside Satriales. Johnny strokes Junior's ego like he's a prized racehorse, but eventually drops the bomb that someone's got to fill in for Hesh since he's got connections in the Big Apple. Tony plays the offended card, pretending Hesh aired their dirty laundry, but Johnny Smooth talks them into a solution. After some haggling, they settle on 250000 and Junior's new boss status gets a party thrown in its honor, with Johnny Sack leading the cheers. Fast forward to the federal heat coming down on the North Jersey crew. Tony, always the strategist, decides to stash all his shady goods at his mother's place in Green Grove Retirement Home. He figures the feds won't bother searching a retirement home, especially one with seniors who can't remember what they had for breakfast. Tony is not alone in this genius plan. He ropes in other capos like Larry, Jimmy, and Raymond to do the same. They turn Green Grove into the unofficial mob headquarters, holding their secret meetings right under Junior's nose. But Livia, the master manipulator, spills the beans to Junior during a visit, making it sound like Tony's playing him like a fiddle. When the feds finally drop the hammer and arrest Junior and his crew, they offer him a sweet deal. Rat out Tony as the real boss, spill the beans about his New York connections through Johnny Sack, and all charges magically disappear. But Junior, old school to the core, flips them the bird. No way he's breaking the code, even if it means doing time in the can. Picture this. Johnny Sack, the boss with a taste for fine dining and an even finer temper, sitting down with Tony, Polly, Silvio, and Pussy at a New Jersey restaurant. Dr. Melfi and her friends walk in, and Polly, ever the ladies' man, starts flirting with them. Melfi, in her own way, catches Tony's attention, and Johnny suggests they join the table. Tony's having none of it, though. Maybe he's not a fan of therapy on the menu. Later, at Vesuvio, Johnny congratulates Polly on his promotion, and they introduce Furio to the mix. Polly tries to shoo Pussy away for some pressing business, and Johnny smirks. Must be hard being left out when important mob matters are on the table. Johnny's the man with the plan for peace among the families, but let's not forget his darker side. Machiavellian tendencies and a knack for eliminating rivals. Johnny's got a soft spot, though, especially when it comes to comments about his wife Ginny's weight. He once ordered a hit on Ralph for a fat joke, and Carmine Sr. saved Ralph's life by not approving it. Johnny's got a knack for making friends like his pal Polly Walnuts. Polly becomes the unwitting informant, thanks to Johnny's little white lies about Carmine's high regard for him. But when Polly realizes it's all a sham, Johnny's in for some serious detracting. During his time as underboss, Johnny's not thrilled with Carmine's leadership and plans to name his son Carmine Jr. as the successor. Things get heated, and Johnny even authorizes a hit on Carmine. But Tony, always the peacemaker, settles the score without bloodshed, much to Johnny's dismay. Imagine the emotional roller coaster Johnny's on he went from future boss to mobster scorned in a minute. Fortunately for Johnny, Carmine Sr. suddenly dies from an excess of protein in his bloodstream. Carmine's death kicks off a family war, and Johnny's crew battles it out with Brainless II. 
after some heavy casualties, a surrender and a reconciliation with Tony, Johnny's back in control. Well, until the feds come knocking. Johnny gets arrested, but he's not ready to relinquish power just yet. In a twist worthy of a Soprano plotline, Jimmy Patrill turned out to be a bigger rat than a New Jersey sewer. All due respect spilled the beans on his double-dealing ways, revealing that he spilled the cannoli on Johnny's criminal escapades dating back to 1981. In prison, Johnny trusts Phil Leotardo to act as the acting boss. His brother-in-law becomes the go-between, and Johnny becomes more self-centered. He's all about maintaining good relationships and avoiding business disputes, even if it means setting boundaries. But Johnny is not one to let prison walls stop him. He gets a release for his daughter's wedding, but the joy is short-lived. The marshals drag him away, and Johnny's crew questions his strength. Tony, however, stands up for him, proving that when it comes to daughters, all bets are off. In the end, Johnny's efforts to maintain control fail. Facing a massive asset seizure, he pleads guilty, effectively ending his reign as boss. His allocation angers both the Soprano and the Lupertazzi families, making him persona non grata. And just when you think Johnny's out of the picture, cancer enters stage left. In 2007, news spreads about Johnny's passing, and the Soprano crew salutes him. A portrait of Johnny joins the Mobster Hall of Fame on the wall next to Carmine and Billy Leotardo, commemorating the man who once called the shots. In a world where loyalty is as rare as a dieting mobster, Johnny Sack stood out as the exception. Rumor had it that he was the Tony Bennett of the Mafia, singing only to his wife. A monogamous mafioso. Now that's a rarer sight than Big Pussy's survival instincts. Behind the wheel of his Mercedes-Benz, Johnny cruised through the Garden State, proving that you can be in the mob and still have a taste for the finer things. Later, he upgraded to a Maserati, because let's face it, even mobsters need a midlife crisis. Dressed to impress, Johnny had a style sharper than Polly Walnut's razor blade collection. His calm demeanor and classy attire made him the underboss with the mostest. And of course, no scene was complete without Johnny puffing on a Marlboro, because nothing says I'm in the mob like a cloud of smoke. But make no mistake, wise guys, smoking kills, and Johnny's fate ultimately proves it. When it came to business, Johnny was the master of enigmatic deliberation. But cross him on matters of honor, especially his wife's, and you'd be wishing you were in witness protection. Just ask Ralph Cifaretto, who learned the hard way that joking about Ginny's weight could have you talking to the fishes. Johnny's loyalty was as flexible as a yoga instructor in a witness protection program. Whether he was subtly pulling strings or convincing Carmine to reconsider violent solutions, Johnny knew how to play the game. He was the voice of moderation in family disputes, like a mobster therapist with a penchant for Marlboros. But when Carmine kicked the cannoli bucket, Johnny's cool demeanor took a vacation. In a power struggle with Carmine Jr., Johnny went from being the godfather of Zen to ordering hits like he was at a mobster clearance sale. Despite facing financial ruin and a one-way ticket back to the joint, Johnny showed that family comes first. He wept at his daughter's wedding, proving that even the toughest mobster has a soft spot. Sure, he lost some respect and dignity, but in the end, Johnny Sack was a made man with a big heart. Just don't make fat jokes about his wife. That's a one-way ticket to a concrete pair of shoes. Richie's involvement in organized crime began at a young age, when he started doing light work and getting into fights around the age of 15. But it wasn't until he caught the eye of Ercole DeMeo, the boss of the DeMeo family, that his rise to power truly began. In 1972, Richie proved his worth by beating Ercole's cousin, Rocco DeMeo, in a fight and taking his leather jacket as a trophy. Impressed by his ruthlessness, Ercole assigned Richie to make his bones by killing a black man who was selling drugs in the old man DeMeo's territory. Richie completed the hit and was made a full-fledged member of the family in 1973. But Richie's time in the spotlight was short-lived. He was sent to prison for 10 years and returned to a very different organization upon his release. Tony Soprano was now the boss, and the relationship between the two men was strained, to say the least. Despite his time away, Richie still saw Tony Soprano as his younger brother's friend, and had difficulty accepting orders from someone who was once subordinate to him. His impetuous and irascible nature made him quick to anger and entitled to inherit everything he wanted simply for paying his dues in prison. Tony recognized Richie's entitlement and promised to work to give him his due, but Richie immediately rebuffed that offer, stating that what was his was not Tony's to give. This tension between the two men continued to escalate throughout the season, 
leading to some of the show's most memorable and violent moments. One of Richie's first actions as a free man was to confront his old partner, Beansy, who was an associate of Tony Soprano. Richie's violent behavior was a hallmark of his time on The Sopranos, and his interactions with Beansy were no exception. After attempting to claim money from Beansy and failing to receive payment at his welcome back party, Richie became increasingly agitated and confrontational. He eventually tracked Beansy down and threatened to shoot him if he didn't pay up. This kind of behavior was all too common for Richie, who often used violence and intimidation to get what he wanted. The situation only escalated from there when Richie waited for Beansy by his car and rammed him with his own vehicle, crushing him between the two cars. And if that wasn't enough, Richie then ran over the paralyzed Beansy with his car twice, leaving him permanently disabled. Tony was forced to intervene and make amends by forcing Richie to build Beansy a ramp for his wheelchair. But even this act of contrition was met with hostility, as Richie famously quipped to Polly and Silvio, I'll build a ramp up to your ass, drive a Lionel up in there. Richie's loan to Tony's childhood friend and gambler, David Scatino, proved to be a catalyst for one of the most intense and violent confrontations of the season. When Scatino managed to get a seat at Tony's high stakes game, Richie flew into a rage and threatened to harm him. I think he even had another Lionel ready. Tony intervened to protect his player and sent Richie away. Later, Tony punished Richie for his disruptive behavior by freezing his debt until Scatino's debt to Tony was retired. It's no secret that Richie had a severe Napoleon complex, and this often manifested in his need to prove his toughness and strength to others. His behavior towards Beansy and others was motivated by his deep-seated insecurities about his size and stature. In reality, Richie's actions were nothing more than attempts to compensate for his perceived shortcomings. He wanted people to know that he was a tough guy and he used violence and intimidation to achieve this end. In the episode Full Leather Jacket, Richie gives Tony Soprano a vintage leather jacket that was taken from tough guy Rocco DeMio as a sign of friendship. Richie boasts to Tony about how he took down tough guy Rocco DeMeo, who was once considered the toughest person around. According to Richie, Rocco was nowhere to be seen after he got through with him. This was just one example of Richie's need to prove himself and show others that he was a force to be reckoned with. Tony hesitantly accepts the gift, but then passes it on to the husband of his cleaning woman, Liliana, who is a mechanical engineer from Poland and currently works as a cab driver. Richie is enraged when he sees Liliana's husband wearing the jacket while dropping off food he had made for Carmela. This makes Richie feel depressed and angry, as he believed that the jacket was a symbol of his toughness and power. But tensions between Richie and Tony continued to simmer. Richie disliked Tony's protege and made man, Christopher Moltisanti, due to his violent relationship with Richie's niece. Their constant friction and disagreements eventually led to a failed attempt on Christopher's life by two young associates of the Soprano crew, Matthew and Sean. The two associates were hoping to impress Richie with their loyalty and willingness to take out one of his enemies. However, their plan ultimately failed, and they were both killed by Tony and his crew. Despite having nothing to do with the planning of the hit, Richie refused to help Matthew afterwards. This incident only served to further strain the relationship between Richie and Tony. But as they say, trouble doesn't come alone. Upon his release, Richie resumed his old relationship with Tony's sister, Janice Soprano, and the two eventually became engaged. However, Janice frequently encouraged Richie to defy Tony as she wanted to be married to the boss herself. Their relationship took a dark turn one night when Janice made a comment that upset Richie. Janice responded with a reference to the real-life slaying of Gambino boss Paul Castellano by John Gotti. Despite this tension, Richie acted as a mentor to his nephew, Jackie Jr., and even planned to take over the family as boss with the approval of Tony's uncle, Corrado Jr. Soprano. However, Jr. ultimately betrayed Richie and tipped off Tony about his plans. Tony ordered Richie's death, but before he could be killed, Janice shot him in the chest and head during an argument about Richie's son's possible homosexuality. Janice called Tony, who had his soldiers dispose of the body by dismemberment at Satriali's. Only a select few knew the truth about Richie's fate, including Tony, Janice, Christopher, and Furio. You see, Janice ain't your average gal. She's got a fuse shorter than a mobster's temper at a snitch convention. Pair her up with Richie, a walking powder keg with a penchant for mayhem. And you've got a relationship that makes fireworks look like child's play. Anyone with half a brain could have seen Richie's expiration date looming on the horizon. The guy practically had rest in peace tattooed on his forehead. But here's the kicker. 
I thought it'd be Tony putting him out of his misery. But life in the Soprano family is never that straightforward. You might wonder why Janice, of all people, ended Richie's chaotic carnival ride. Well, let me tell you, any other dame in that crew would have taken the shot without batting an eyelash. But not Janice. She's got a stubborn streak. She wouldn't take a hit, not from Richie or anyone else. If you've watched the video up to this point, then you're really curious. And now we're going to answer the questions we asked at the very beginning of the video. In The Sopranos, what would happen if Tony Soprano made Richie his underboss? If Tony Soprano ever thought of boosting Richie to underboss, it'd be like trying to fit a square peg into a round pizzeria. Richie fancied himself the true heir, blaming Tony's stint in the can for his delayed ascent to the throne. Junior spilled the cannoli, letting Tony know Richie couldn't peddle the idea to the other capos. Richie, with his bravado and a jacket claiming he's the toughest guy in Essex County, was more out of touch than a mobster at a tech conference. With no crew backing and everyone living the good life under Tony's rule, Richie's demands for so-called dues were as welcome as a rat in the bing. Richie, hungry for power, would have ended up as Tony's personal betrayer. The other capos would have smelled weakness quicker than a hitman finds a target. In short, Richie's underboss dreams would have been kaput before he could even put on his famous jacket. What would have happened to Richie if Janice hadn't pulled the trigger? Pondering Richie's alternate destiny, free from Janice's gunshot, reveals a dark mob calculus. My take? His demise was inevitable. The mafia's history of eliminating liabilities, coupled with Junior's tip and Tony's silent nod at the bing, painted a grim picture. Janice's intervention merely synchronized with the inevitable. Richie, a casualty in the orchestrated chaos of the Sopranos world, was destined for a chilling end sooner or later. Mikey Palmice's journey up the mafia career ladder in the hit series, The Sopranos, is a roller coaster of loyalty, brutality, and hatred. Mikey, who started out as a simple soldier on Junior's crew, quickly becomes Corrado's right hand man after Jackie April's death and is given the cherished role of conciliary in the episode Pax Soprana. Mikey is a complex character with traits of kindness and humility towards those he feels deserve respect. But at the same time, he is intolerant and cruel to those who get in his way or try to harm Junior. He deeply detests Tony Soprano, and Tony doesn't make his life any easier by regularly badgering him. Despite his loyalty to Junior, Mikey's acute dislike for Tony has made him one of Tony's main foes on the show. With each new episode, Mikey's character becomes more complex and interesting, keeping viewers tensely guessing what he will do next. The moment Jackie April is diagnosed with cancer and it becomes clear that he's going to die, Junior quickly springs into action to secure his throne. Mikey is determined to wipe out all of Junior's adversaries, including Tony Soprano and Christopher Moltisanti. He makes his goal clear when he states that Junior Soprano is the new boss, and he ain't respecting old arrangements. Mikey's loyalty is put to the test when Brendan Fallone and Christopher Moltisanti hijack trucks belonging to a firm under June's protection. Corrado asks Mikey to sort it out, and he does so with the utmost brutality. Killing Brendan in the episode, Denial, Anger, Acceptance. But Mikey's brutality doesn't end there. In a shocking turn of events, he recruits two Russians to stage Christopher's execution, enraging him to the point where he wants to kill Mikey in retaliation. Tony Soprano intervenes, warning Christopher not to dare touch Mikey because Paul Mice is a made man and Christopher was just an associate at the time. Instead, Tony takes matters into his own hands by brutally beating Mikey with a stapler. I wonder how the boy reacted to this. When it comes to the mafia world, every move can be your last. And when Tony beat up Mikey, many people wondered how the Sopranos managed to get away with it, considering Mikey was a made man. When Tony was the captain and beat up Mikey, the solution for Paul Mice was to go to Junior to settle the matter by having a sit down. But it's worth considering that Soprano beat the crap out of Mikey when there were no witnesses around, not even the boy. So there was no evidence. Who knows what Paul Mice was imagining? Maybe he dreamed it up in the first place. Even if it did come down to a sit down, how would Mikey be able to prove his point? Tony has a high IQ and a degree in street smarts to go along with it. He knows how to behave in situations like this. Just remember how he acted when Uncle Philly was throwing accusations at him and demanding Blondetto on a silver platter. Well, or the episode with Ralph's joke. Despite the fact that Tony knew the truth, he didn't give up and behave professionally when Johnny sputtered and demanded Ralph's head. 
Tony always has an ace up his sleeve that he's no cheap shot. Yes, Mikey could have gotten Tony in trouble. But how would such a call for help look in the eyes of the Goodfellas? Calling the boss for help is not a good idea. After all, they're all tough guys, and everyone should be able to solve their own problems. Besides, who would want to advertise their failure? Junior soon discovers that his tailor's grandson committed suicide after taking dope bought from one of Larry Bariz's top dealers. Junior takes matters into his own hands and orders Mikey to kill the dealer to prevent him from selling drugs to children. As a result, Mikey, along with Joey Eggs, throws Rusty off the same bridge the kid jumped off of, sending a clear message to anyone who dares cross Junior's path. However, the move didn't sit well with the capo, especially Larry, who felt that Junior should have prearranged such drastic measures. Of course, Mikey Palmas is a smiling and friendly guy, but don't be fooled by his appearance. Behind the mask of charm lurks a cruel, sadistic sociopath who enjoys inflicting pain and suffering. Tony and the other capos have referred to him as the disease since childhood because of his sick nature. Mikey revels in the power he wields, often bullying and taunting his victims before delivering the final blow. In addition, Mikey has a deep hatred for Junior's nephew, Tony Soprano, and has longed to take him down for years. Through Mikey and Livia's manipulations, Junior decides to take an extreme step. He orders Tony's assassination. Then an associate named Donnie Paduana sees an opportunity for himself and helps organize an assassination attempt on Tony. But the briquettes fail the assignment, and Mikey has to clean up the whole mess. Paul Misi is glad to try and solves the issue in one-two punch by shooting Donnie in his car. Recognizing that he can't let such a daring deed go, Tony decides to take action. Junior, the slippery old fox, was not to be underestimated. Everyone knew he was up to something, and the question was, who would he use this time? The Sopranos targeted Chucky and Mikey, determined to prevent June from making any further strikes. Tony caught Chucky off guard at the Jersey City Marina, where he was chilling on his boat. Carrying a large fish, Tony suddenly pulled a barrel out of its mouth and fired several shots at Chucky, ending his life. Mikey's fate was also determined. Chris and Polly catch up with him while he's jogging, and they say sports are good for your health. One minute, he was running through the woods, the next he was sitting on his butt in the creek. Mikey tried to get to his feet, but his soaked clothes made it hard to move. Worse, at that moment, Christopher appeared and pointed a gun at him. Mikey realized he was in trouble and started begging for mercy, but Chris was hardly Mother Teresa. It was clear that Mikey's time had come. But then Polly appeared out of nowhere. There was panic on his face and he was desperately scratching his arms. Fucking poison ivy all over me, he exclaimed. Christopher fired the fatal shot and Mikey's lifeless body collapsed into the water. A perfectly satisfying ending for a character who had caused so much pain and suffering. Mikey left behind a wife and a boy. In the world of The Sopranos, life and death are not what they seem. In the episode From Where to Eternity, Christopher regains consciousness after a coma. However, his return from the other side of the world is not like the standard light at the end of the tunnel. He tells Polly and Tony about his trip to hell, where he saw Brendan Falone and Mikey in an Irish bar drinking alcohol in a friendly manner. But the message Christopher brought back from the furnace was even more frightening. Three o'clock! A superstitious Polly visits a psychic who gives him the names of the people he's killed, including Mikey Palmice. But the psychic hasn't said everything yet. He tells Polly that Mikey wonders if Polly still has an itch. This is a reference to when Polly, while chasing Mikey through the woods, got caught in a bush of poison ivy. By the way, if you're curious about the three o'clock theory, post in the comments. I'll try to make a separate video about it. So why did Tony hate Mikey so much? The Sopranos isn't afraid to explore complicated relationships. Tony and Junior's relationship is a prime example of this. When Tony was a kid, Junior was a second father to him. He relied heavily on Junior's opinion, perhaps even more than he relied on his own father's words. But as they both grew older and made captains, their relationship began to crumble. Worse, Junior had taken on a man who had nothing but contempt for Tony. This guy was almost like a replacement for Tony. The same age, stylish, smart, and more respected by Junior. This was a huge blow to Tony's self-esteem, and he felt a deep resentment and jealousy. He couldn't understand why this fashionably dressed bastard had more trust and respect from his uncle. As a result, Tony was treating Mikey like a piece of crap, which only worsened their already sour relationship. 
Now, there is no clear indication that Mikey was a fool. In fact, he's presented as a cunning and ruthless man who managed to advance within the ranks of Junior's crew. He was known for his ability to manipulate situations to his advantage. In the end, Mikey fell not because of a lack of intelligence, but because of his inability to control his violent tendencies and his willingness to take unreasonable risks. Feach's story has its origins in Sicily in the first and second half of the 20th century. Born into a world where the Sicilian mafia wielded incredible power and enormous influence, Feach becomes a man of honor at a young age. Seeking new opportunities, Feach immigrates to the United States and stops in Jersey, where he becomes part of the DeMeo crime family. Feach moves quickly through the ranks and eventually becomes a capo. Feach was highly regarded for his ability to make money. Early in his career, Feach acted as the personal driver for notorious gangster Tommy Pinto. One of Feach's most lucrative ventures was gambling. In particular, he was known for running a super profit-making high-stakes card game that featured some of the most famous players, including mafia figures, celebrities, and sportsmen. The year was 1982, and two rookie gangsters, Jackie April and Tony Soprano, were looking to make a name for themselves in the DeMeo crime family. They plotted to heist a Feach's game, hoping to make an impression on the bosses and move up the ranks. The plan was to have their friend Ralph Cifaretto join them, but it turned out he had contracted gonorrhea, so Ralphie jumped off the theme at the last minute. Never giving up hope, Jackie and Tony decided to go all in, knocked off the game, and snatched up almost 20 grand. Feach was furious at this raid and complained to the family's superiors about the disrespect from the teenagers. However, despite his grievances, he had to relent after a sit-down involving Tony's father, Johnny, and Jackie's older brother, Richie, respected capos who stepped in to defend the robbers. The underground card game that Feach was running was most likely outside of Newark, and Feach was of the impression that that's where the DeMeo family's authority ends. When Johnny Boy or Uncle June demanded that Feach cut the family some slack, he probably told them to go smoke bamboo. Tony and Jackie were no fools. They kept their ears open and knew that Feach was acting on his own with only a short crew. Moreover, by his attitude, Lamana was incurring the wrath of the DeMeo family. Tony and Jackie then made a brave and calculated decision. They decided to heist Feach, knowing full well that if they were successful, the tough guys of the DeMeo family would be fascinated by the fact that the young men had seized the initiative. In 1984, Feach, along with other major mobsters, was busted on racketeering charges. Despite facing a 20-year sentence, Feach stayed true to his roots and refused to cooperate with law enforcement in exchange for a lighter sentence. As a result, Feach served his sentence at the Federal Correctional Institution at Allenwood, where he quickly gained a reputation for being tough and uncompromising. In Feach's own words, on his first day of incarceration, he set a record precedent by taking down an enormous black inmate in the canteen. However, it must be kept in mind that Feach liked to sugarcoat his stories so it is difficult to say with certainty what really happened. Despite his imprisonment, Feach retained ties to the DeMeo crime family and continued to wield influence from behind bars. In 2004, Feach and several other mobsters were released after serving sentences handed down in the 80s. Once on the outside, Feach found it difficult to adjust to the changes that had occurred during his 20 years in prison. During a visit to Junior's house, Feach chatted with Bobby and Corrado, and touched on the changes in society during his time in prison. What surprised him the most was the fact that Broad's shave bushes, which shows how detached from reality the mafioso was. During the visit, Feach's real motivation also became apparent. The old man wanted to get the go-ahead to get back into business, and in particular, he wanted his old bookmaker's office back. After some thought, Tony and June reluctantly agreed, with Soprano informing Feach not to step on anyone's toes. When Tony Blundetto got out of jail around the same time as Feach, the Sopranos organized a party for him. Feach was then curious if Tony had something in mind that Blundetto could get involved in. Tony revealed that he planned to hook his cousin up with a scheme to steal airbags, and Bobby thoroughly explained the scheme to Feach, who wasn't around when the scheme gained traction. Feach was shocked by the new revelations, asked Soprano to send his regards to Blundetto, and walked away. Later, at the Bada Bing, Soprano, watching from above, saw Feach handing Tony B an envelope of cash. Tony was genuinely surprised that Feach was making money after spending so little time on the outside. Tony B and Feach were merrily rolling along in the car after a long day of work at Kim's laundromat. As they talked, 
Fitch expressed his belief that Blundetto's search for a legitimate job was just a cover for his potential career in the world of crime. He even compared it to his own bakery, which was just a front for dark deeds. But suddenly, their conversation was interrupted when Feech noticed something intriguing. He parked his car and approached a lawn mowing company in the neighborhood. Feech claimed the place belonged to his nephew, Gary. He approached Sal Vitro, who was neatly mowing the lawn, and asked him what he was doing. Sal suddenly burst into a temper and started insulting Feech, demanding to be left alone. However, Feech did not give up and responded to the challenge by forcefully kicking Sal in the balls, knocking him to the ground. But instead of stopping the violence, Feech continued beating Sal as if unleashing his accumulated anger. All of this chaos turned into a gruesome scene when Feech placed Sal's hand on the edge of the sidewalk and began to mercilessly stomp on it, breaking it in the process. Thankfully, Tony B. stepped in just in time, realizing that they were both on parole and couldn't afford to get into more trouble. He emphatically urged Fitch to stop. It soon became clear that Sal was a longtime friend of Polly's family and regularly mowed the neighborhood lawns, including Aunt Mary's lawn. When she complained to Polly about Feech's nephews, Gary and Jimmy, who were behaving carelessly on the job, Polly decided to step in. At Feech's bakery, Polly, after saying hello, began small talk about the problems in Tony and Carmela's marriage. At first, the atmosphere seemed relaxed, but when Polly suddenly turned his attention to his conflict with Sal, the situation escalated sharply. With a sullen expression on his face, Feech fell silent and offered Polly a biscotti. But when he refused, the old man claimed he had every right to occupy the neighborhood where Sal was working. Feech's anger only built up, and he began yelling at Polly, accusing him of being disrespectful and not honoring his status as an honorable prisoner. Polly, not giving up, stood his ground, claiming that Feech didn't grasp the new order of things and had no privileges. This enraged the veteran mafioso, and he angrily ordered Polly to get lost. Convinced he was right, Polly decided to visit Gary and ordered him to cede the zone to Salvitro. But Gary didn't agree to comply with Polly's demands, just like Feech, and sent Walnut the hell away. This was the drop that overflowed Polly's patients, who suddenly attacked Gary and his buddy. The incident forced Tony to call a sit-down to find a way out of the situation. Tony, with the wisdom of an experienced mafioso, proposed to divide the neighborhood in half. On one side would be Sal and his men, on the other side, Gary and his faithful assistants. Sal was disappointed, feeling left out. But Polly, showing his cunning and ability to compromise, assured Sal that he could also mow Tony and Johnny Sack's lawns. Feech, however, remained unhappy with the decision. Tony realized that he had to take care of the old man because he was becoming a problem. Lamana had no respect for Tony's authority at all and constantly screwed over Soprano and his crew. Tony was tired of Feech's defiance. The old man would nod his head in agreement when Tony gave him orders, but he would do whatever he wanted, stepping into other people's territory and violating the rules. It wasn't long before Tony got wind of Feech's deceitful scheme to rob a wedding. Several cars had been stolen from the celebration of a close acquaintance of Tony's, and that was the final straw. Tony knew something had to be done, but was unwilling to resort to bloody methods against the old man. Still having respect for Feech, Tony looked for other ways to resolve the problem. And that's where Christopher Moltisanti and Benny Fazio came to the rescue. With the help of deceit, they induced Feech to hide several stolen flat-screen televisions in his garage. Then fate relentlessly intervened in this game. A parole officer showed up at Feech's house and noticed one of the TVs in the living room. He conducted an inspection of the garage and discovered the rest of the stolen TVs. Feech was arrested and jail awaited him, which became his grim asylum for the rest of his life. Many people fail to notice that the TV scheme is not an accident. Usually, Feech would be visited by some other parole officer, but in this scene, a brand new officer arrives who is almost certainly on the Mafia payroll. He knows what to look out for and immediately suggests checking out the garage, which once again proves that Tony Soprano came up with the idea to frame Feech. Hesh is not a wise guy in the ranks of the Mafia. Despite this, Tony regularly turns to him for advice on a variety of topics. Hesh is a master of keeping a low profile. He prefers to spend his time playing cards, eating with Tony's crew, or at the Bada Bing nightclub. Despite his discreet nature, Hesh is vital to the Sopranos. 
Hesh's Jewish background adds an intriguing layer to his character. In a world dominated by Italian Americans, Hesh is an unusual outsider who has managed to carve out a niche for himself. Through this dynamic, interesting relationships between Hesh and the other characters emerge. And it's always interesting to watch him navigate the complex web of relationships within the Italian American set. A savvy businessman, he made his fortune in the record industry, founding F Note Records in the 50s. Hesh had a sharp eye for talent, and thanks to him, many black musicians gained fame. However, he didn't stop at making money from selling records. Hesh managed to get himself listed as a co writer of songs, so he was owed a portion of the royalties. In fact, this is quite a popular practice even now. A prime example is the Backstreet Boys. For many years, there were endless disputes between the musicians and their producer. One of the main stumbling blocks was related to finances. Perlman was brazenly taking a large chunk of the band's income and not paying them what they were due under the contract. The most incredible part of the story is that Lou Perlman had gotten himself into a position where he was legally considered the sixth member of the band on paper. This entitled him to receive a percentage of all band-related sales for the rest of his life. But fortunately, the band was able to get rid of this sixth member during the trial. The judge who heard the case found himself on the side of the Backstreet Boys. He stated that his daughter is a big fan of the band and has a poster of them hanging on her wall. But to his surprise, the judge did not see Lou Pearlman's face on the poster. In the end, the judge rejected the producer's complaints, and the band was left without a sixth member. But let's return to the main character of our story. Despite his greed, Hesh possesses a cool head and good-naturedness. Among Tony's closest associates, he is also unusual in that he has a good education. In addition to business, Hesh is fond of breeding horses and loves dark-skinned women. His son-in-law, Eli, has also gotten involved in Hesh's loan shark business, which creates some fun family dynamics. Hesh first made his mark in the pilot episode, acting in conjunction with Tony as part of a scam to scam insurance companies through their debtor, Alex Mahaffey. Hesh and Pussy went to great lengths to try to intimidate Mahaffey. They even dragged him to a waterfall. However, it was done in a calm manner. Mahaffey realized that refusal to cooperate would result in death. In the future, Hesh advises Tony not to get involved with the family of Hasidic Jews during the dispute over who will get their hotel. Hesh's predictions tangentially come true, but Hesh manages to help Tony end the tense negotiations by cluing the Sopranos into the Hasidic Jews' weak spot. One of the traits that makes Hesh such a strong character is his extraordinary standpoint. As a Jew in the world of the Italian-American mafia, he can offer ideas that no one else can. Whether it's a business conversation or just chatting with Tony's men, Hesh always has something to say. In the episode, a hit is a hit. Hesh plays a key role in trying to help Tony's nephew, Christopher, make sure that his girlfriend, Adriana, is barely qualified to work in the music business. However, this is just the beginning of the drama. Once Chris gets in touch with Hesh on behalf of a rapper, Massive Genius, claiming that Hesh owes a portion of royalties to the black musician's widow, things really start to heat up. In response to Hesh's refusal to pay, the rapper threatened to sue, but Hesh had the good sense to threaten a countersuit, accusing the rapper of copyright violation. Let's dive briefly into Hesh's past to understand the origins of his conflict with the massive genius. Back in the day, the music industry was a lawless place ruled by crooked concert hall owners, agents and radio stations, as well as record distributors and stores. But at the center of it all was the mafia. Hesh Rabkin was an entrepreneur who knew how to make money, and he did so by contracting young and promising musicians. However, his contracts were extremely unfair, as they gave him the right to all of the artist's written songs. His label was a place where many musicians dreamed of a career, and Hesh knew how to use this envious atmosphere to his advantage. In the lawless world of the music industry of the 50s and 60s, you had to have connections to survive. For Hesh, that meant getting in touch with Johnny Boy and paying him a tax to settle territorial issues. Hesh and Johnny Boy teamed up in their quest to exploit the lawlessness and corruption in the music industry to make big money. And they succeeded by having the right amount of muscle. Hesh knew how to make money in music, and Johnny Boy knew how to stand up for his people. Together, they created more than just a friendship. They created a business empire that kept paying and paying. These two saw opportunities where others saw only troubles. Unlike many other partners in the Mafia world, Hesh and Johnny were equals. Hesh always paid Johnny's dues, and Johnny never felt the need to step in and risk killing the golden egg-laying goose. 
Both Hesh and Johnny made a lot of money, but not everyone was happy about their success. Many envied them and felt that the money they earned should be theirs. However, the old school mafia followed its own rules, among which was a taboo on embezzling the profits of other mafiosi. When Johnny passed away, the team, including Hesh, went to Tony. Soprano was a young and immature leader, and everyone speculated whether he would be able to stand up to the challenge. However, Tony had innate leadership skills that allowed him to keep Johnny's crew loyal. By the time the series began, the music industry had undergone major changes, and Hesh was working less and less at his record label and more and more on the street under Tony's umbrella of protection. Hesh wasn't Tony's most profitable stock, but everyone knew he belonged with the Sopranos. Whoever tried to make a move on him risked getting himself in trouble. When the rapper showed up, Tony was forced to deal with it. In this world, respect is of the utmost significance, and even a small amount of money can spark a fight. In the episode Christopher, Hesh helped Silvio in his argument about Christopher Columbus Day by connecting him through his friend to a Native American casino landlord. In The Sopranos, Hesh is a character who is always in the midst of events. For example, in the episode In Camelot, Tony makes a shocking discovery. His father, Hesh, and Phil Leotardo were co-owners of the racetrack, and after Johnny Boy died, he willed his share to his mistress, Fran Feldstein. Tony arranged a meeting with Phil and Hesh to demand a share, and although they reluctantly agreed, tensions were high. But these were all blossoms compared to the drama that played out in the members-only episode. Hesh and his son-in-law were attacked by members of the Leotardo crew, who thought the son-in-law was doing business on their turf without permits. The mobsters set fire to the son-in-law's gas tank to smoke the duo out of the car and then proceeded to beat up Eli. The son-in-law, trying to escape, manages to test the bumper and Hesh gets a savory punch in the face. However, Hesh wasn't the kind of man to give up without a fight. He demanded that Phil make amends and got compensation with Tony's support. Even with all that had happened, Hesh still took the time to visit Tony in the hospital as he recovered from his injury. The final season of The Sopranos was full of drama, and Hesh was right in the middle of it. Tony needed money to cover a string of gambling losses, and Hesh gave him a bridge loan of $200,000. However, when Tony didn't pay back the loan on time, things went south. That's when Tony started berating Hesh about the interest on the loan. Obviously, the argument escalated their once warm relationship. However, when Hesh's girlfriend Renata died while sleeping, Tony repaid the debt out of respect. Admittedly, his condolences were brief and apathetic, suggesting that their relationship had been irreparably damaged. I believe Renata's death saved Hesh's life. Tony could have made Hesh just vanish, thus getting rid of the debt. At the end of the series, Hesh's fate remains unclear. Perhaps he continues to profit from the aubergines. Who knows? If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to Vano VHS and hit the like button.